Hi, guys, and welcome to the Fight Fast podcast. Today, we've got Jim Smokey West with us, going to talk about his new book and other fight-related, self-defense-related topics. And uh, Jim, welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here. It's been a while. Yeah, long. it's been a while. Yeah. So uh, we were just talking before we started uh, recording about his book, which he has published and is now available on Amazon. And uh, he's going on some radio shows to promote the book. And uh, that's kind of going to be one of the main topics we discussed today. And Jim, I'll let you go ahead and let people know where they can find it. Yeah, if you've got your uh, computer screen open, anybody there, you can see the book cover. It's called uh, A Mind for the Fight, by obviously by James Smokey West. But uh, it, it, it's the, the best thing I've done. Uh, I've created something new, actually. That's very cool. Yeah, I know we've, we've discussed it uh, for a while, and you've been working on this thing. You know, it's a huge project and a, and a huge undertaking, and, and it's pretty awesome to hear that it's finally done and people are going to be able to start enjoying it and getting getting the value out of it from all your years of experience and knowledge with uh, self-defense and combat. Yeah, well, it's an interesting book. Uh, it sort of kicks off the American extension fighting as an actual style or system. The book itself doesn't teach you how to kick and punch. You know, it doesn't have all those nasty graphics of, you know, like uh, all these other hardcore books. It, it, it's, it's about a unifying mindset, the evolutionary mindset of dealing with extreme violence uh, in, in real world situations, you know, because that's kind of my forte. And it's sort of structured around a few things. I've got, oh, maybe 10 actual, you know, very descriptive fights that I've been in, some of the more bloody ones uh, in, my, in my life, they're all real. And we use, an, uh, use a systems-focused approach so we can reveal system failures and uh, system variances so that a person can actually learn and enhance their uh, mindset by, by not feeling guilty or I shouldn't have done this or I should have done that. All of the answers, I created these three toolboxes, three tool sets uh, that, that is, you know, involves the entire system. And I put some tools in each one of those. So for example, if you were in a, a scuff, scuffle on the street or somebody and what well, something didn't go right, you didn't feel good about yourself, instead of going, wow, I screwed this up or I screwed that up, you can, you can look at what you did and then you can find, reach into either a mechanical, uh, technical or psychological tool set. And you can reach in there in that bucket and you can go, oh, there's five or six more things that I can add to my, you know, what I've been working towards, right? So it's yeah. about continuous improvement as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's done really well. Um, Very cool. So, yeah, and then I've taken a risk. Uh, I've been talking to a guy named George Clark, who's one of my black belts from back in the 70s. Uh, he went on in life to become one of, uh, you know who Jim Harrison is, right? Yeah. Uh, he recently passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I've been invited to his... Uh, Celebration of Life party in the second week of May in wow. Missoula, Montana. Chuck Norris, those guys are going to be there. Uh, so it's actually pretty cool. So it's, it revolves around, uh, I guess, Joe Lewis and Bruce Lee and all those guys back from the what I call the godfathers of the industry. They, they wrote these 23 technical fight principles. And truthfully, if you go back a couple of thousand years to the, you know, Musashi's Five Rings and others, they had 20 technical fight principles. Uh, largely, if you're not a very skilled fighter and under the toolage of one of the, the greats or, or, or direct lineage to the American karate system uh, under Robert Trias, some, somewhere in that direct line, you might not even know these fight principles exist. And if you do, uh, it's difficult to digest 23 technical fight principles. And, you know, yeah. uh, conservation of energy, angle, you know, angle of momentum, uh, critical distance, and it goes on and on. So I actually, you know, pay homage and acknowledge and laundry list those technical fight principles, but I've rewritten them. I've actually bundled them up, uh, wrapped them underneath of 10 new technical fight principles, which are very pragmatic that anybody could pick up this book and read and actually yeah. make sense. And it's geared towards, you know, just surviving a real fight. 
whether Very you're in cool. a ring or in the street, yeah, anybody. And That's it's awesome. done really, really well. Yeah. That's awesome. I know I'm excited to read it. Um, I'll be, I'll be ordering it right after we get off this. Definitely. <laughs> um, so I do kind of wanted to back up a little bit. Some people, some people are familiar with your work that, um, that are, you know, part of our audience and other people might not know who you are. So I wanted to give you a chance to kind of introduce yourself and your experience and then maybe talk a little bit about the origins of <clears throat> your, your unique system. You know, it's, it's, uh, kind of an incredible thing to think about actually creating a new uh, fighting system. And I, and I'm curious why, obviously you, you have extensive knowledge and background in different systems, which are great systems, but you felt like maybe there was something missing or, or kind of what was the impetus to bring you to think I need to, I need to do something new here because something must have been lacking. Right. And so I'm just curious to hear kind of that story. Well, you're right. It, it, it It's really, really very cool to me, right? Because uh, it's been a long time coming. I've actually been working on this for better part of 30 years. And I have a very eclectic background. I mean, I dropped out of school in the 11th grade to join the Army because my brothers and cousins were all Green Berets and special operators. And, you know, I just felt like that's where I needed to be. Plus, as a kid, I was having a lot of struggles. You know, I came out of a very violent upbringing. And I uh, used to fight all the time, all the time. Um, and of course, it was a interesting time. And I'm i be 66 this coming April. So you know, I came up when they were doing forced integration, busting. You know, the, the same. It seems like the same problems they have today they had then. You know, all this racial stuff. I honestly believe it's created by uh, politicians and not by people, because you know, 50 percent of my fr good from close friends are white or Spanish and the other or Asian and the other 50% are Afro-Americans because I grew up in a real hardcore boxing fighting community. And in fact, so I joined the military. I had, you know, my grandfather was a world champion wrestler. His name was A.D. Holton. My dad was a, a World War II bare knuckle boxer. I just came up in a kind of harsh, harsh yeah. environment, you know? Yeah. And uh, so when I, after I joined the military, uh, you know, my second assignment was in a, in Germany, and I met a black guy. His name was Ronald McKenzie. And he's one of the most wicked uh, kung fu stylists I've ever met in my life. Tai Chi Chuan Wu Shu, and he enhanced it. He was a Yip Man offspring in a way, but uh, he 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 was a very methodical guy. That uh, and this is what I find interesting. Uh, I was over there drinking and getting in trouble, and I had a, a Hawaiian roommate actually. His name was Craig Sullivan, and he was studying this kung fu and and. He was like, hey, why don't you come down and work out with us? I'm like, okay, okay. And, uh, you know, we were doing sticky hands, trapping, you know, and all this good stuff and, you know, learning all the different monkey and praying yeah. mantis and just everything in the world. And during this time, Bruce Lee was, you know, hitting the airwaves. And, and I was like, I was studying every line, every move and working out at, at midnight, first thing in the morning at night, just like a crazy person. And, uh, it was really awkward. At the end of four months of training with uh, Ronald, he comes up and he it was twenty dollars a month. He gives me my money back, and I'm like, "What the hell? You kicking me out of class or what?" And he goes, "No, man." He says, "You just do everything right, and uh, <laughs> you you don't say anything, you don't ask questions, you just do." So I'm giving you, I'm refunding your money, and you never have to pay for another lesson. And, you know, advance the clock a few years. I'm a tenth degree black belt, you know, certified by the uh, original American, you know, I'm one of the original American open style karate practitioners. Uh, but I've never paid for a martial arts lesson in my life. Wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, I, I find that interesting. So, so I, but I got out of the military in the mid seventies for a year. I wanted to fight pro. I didn't have any guidance because uh, I'll back up a little in 1975, I was fighting local tournaments in Europe and beating everybody up in the gym or getting beat up, whatever the case may be. But uh, in 1975, I went to European Internationals, and I got to meet Bill Superfork Wallace, uh, Heidi Ochai, just these masters of, you know, like that you read about and see in movies. I'm like, yeah. oh, my God. And, uh, man, I was starstruck. I and mean, I was like, I, I just want to be better. I I've got to do more. I've always had this concept, you know, the Japanese word Kaizen is loosely translated as continuous, continual improvement. 
So, and along the way, you know, I never forget, uh, we were walking like on, we were in this big military gym uh, and on one end they had a Taekwondo stuff. We had our Kung Fu stuff and our wrestlers in the middle and a boxing team in the other the corner. And uh, it, it was an influential time. We're walking home one day to the barracks and this uh, Taekwondo kid, a little blue belt comes running up to me and my, my Sifu, my, you know, uh, Ronald McKenzie. And he goes, Hey, what do you, what do you do if you're in a, if you're in an elevator and some guy just starts windmilling on you, I'll never forget it. And it was funny. And he, he steps back and he does a high rise and block. And I'm thinking that'll never work. <laughs> uh, and he, he was being facetious, obviously. And he goes, he says, I couldn't really answer that question for you. He says, because that's one of those what if things. Mm -hmm. And I think Dean, you've heard me this say, say this as well, where it comes from. He says, when that if becomes reality, then you'll know. And of course yeah. I had a lot of street in me. So it just made a lot of sense. And I started comparing and analyzing what other people were doing from the floor up, you know, and then, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I continued to progress. Uh, my civilian fight life didn't work out. I got uh, getting in a little mischief and doing some bad things, and, uh, fighting. I became a, uh, Dan, Danny Wilson, who's a 10th degree grandmaster in the American open style karate system. Mate, actually ended up promoting me. Uh, along the way, I got my first degree black belt in the late, you know, mid to late seventies with, uh, from him and a guy named Keith Hayflick. Keith Hayflick was one of the roughest guys that ever walked, ever, in, ever, you know, threw a karate kick or punch. But at the time he was the United States light heavyweight, uh, uh, professional light heavyweight, uh, kickboxing champion. And he fought the first 11 round kickboxing match to, uh, Jeff Smith who I'm sure you know of. Uh, he's one of, the, one of the forefathers of this industry. But So I was involved with all that mess. But anyway, I got in a little trouble, decided to rejoin the Army. I got some education a little bit so I could go into Special Forces. I you know, followed, pursued that and got involved with, you know, the, the Mike, Michael Lichonis types, you know, all the, the, the Gary O'Neill types, you know, all the soft tissue, knife, gun, you know, just yeah. everything I could get involved with. And uh, I never quit working out. And there was a boxer named Anthony Bradley, who he's actually been an assistant Olympic coach. He's put his hands on virtually every heavyweight boxer or professional that, you know, everything from, uh, you know, Marvin Johnson to, uh, I, I mean, Christ, you can name 30 different professional top ranked tier fighters over the years and they've they've come before uh anthony or his nickname is brad dog and uh, it, it, awkwardly enough i actually went to jump school with him in 1972. wow <laughs> and uh we're still great friends to this day and between him and a, a guy named uh bill crane they call him wild bill crane teaching me how to throw an overhand right so i started incorporating the box and stuff and if i back that up when i started kickboxing with the american guys uh, American open style karate. The first thing that uh, my coach told me, if you want to fight with us, you got to learn how to box, you know, kickbox. Mm -hmm. And so three nights a week, I was going down to Ray Brown's place, the Broad Street Box Gym in Richmond, Virginia. And it was like an old Rocky movie. So I, I started blending all these styles and systems early on in my life. And because I have a lot of street fight, and every time I go out, it's just what works, works. And I got to tell you, an old Rocky, Rocky Marciano overhand right does really well in the streets you know that with a little bit of an attitude uh, knowing how to position yourself and stand so i started blending these systems pretty young actually billy crane by the way if i drop back into his 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 history his daddy was a sparring partner for rocky marciano so the overhand wow. right that i deliver when i'm doing work with you guys is the same overhand right so you know to me it always it always comes back to what works for you yeah, you know, like you're younger, your experiences in life are different. And, you know, you're going to be prone to a certain fight style. You know, fighters are either runners, counter fighters, or aggressive guys. You're going to fall directly into one of those categories. And it's stuff that's going to work for you. So through the years, I, you know, I started evaluating these systems. Uh, once I retired from the military, as you know, I opened up my own stuff. I, started, I trained guys, Stevie Graham. Judy Mayran, Dale Comstock, all, all have gone on to do great things. 
Uh, and during that time, I was, I was in Carolina, and that's where Joe Lewis is from. So we we hooked up. I did a lot of training with Joe through the years, and I, you know, I picked up a lot of a lot of good stuff from Joe. You know, and he's a pretty tough bird. Didn't have a lot of street fights, but his his brother sure did. And they're mean as anything. They're as mean as Keith Haplick was, or worse. You know, constantly in and out of jail. Hell, Keith got shot in the chest in '85 and killed. So, uh, you, you know, at, at some point in time, one of the things I learned through the American Open Style Karate system is that up to the first, second degree black belt level is what you learn and take out of the system. In order to get my third degree, is what you bring back to the system. So, you know, during that time, you know, uh, I started bringing back stuff I'd learned in the military, uh, things I transitioned from street fighting. I got involved with the Gracie Jiu Jitsu crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my former students is a, his name's Eric Pence. He's out in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, I actually got promoted him uh, first and secondary black belt in American Jiu Jitsu from him. And he's one of my black belts in uh, karate. So, yeah. you know, so it just, you know, it goes full circle. Even my co writer in my book is a very interesting guy. Uh, his name is Justin McCauley. His dad brought him to me because he just wanted to learn, you know, how to fight as a seven year old. Mm -hmm. and he was one of my little junior black belts. And uh, now he's 34 years old, 6'2. He's never given up on martial arts. And his dad was actually on uh, Dale's team in uh, Delta. Okay. So, you know, the whole family, the full circle thing. Yeah. And so there are a lot of guys, Roger Dabney, you know, who you know. Mm -hmm. they've been trying to analyze what goes on in my head to a point where they could break it down into teaching points and put it into words. And no one's ever been able to do that. Well, Justin's been my lifelong student. Plus he's, he moved on in his own life and he studied in the, and you know, the Abu Dhabi, you know, the Jiu Jitsu and judo. And he lived in Dubai for eight years. He worked in Japan and uh, Germany when he was over there as a kid with his dad growing up bartender got in some street fights and bouncing and uh he's even today he studies four nights a week of jiu-jitsu he's in uh, maryland now uh adelphi and he goes to boxing twice a week and he goes to muay thai kickboxing and we get together on weekends to shore up what you know so he could he actually has a degree in journalism he loves okay. to write so he knows how to extract that information and organize it Mm -hmm. So this is the, this book is really awesome. We spend hours, 18 hours a weekend, just putting it to test, working it out, beating each other up, organizing, you know, the, the, all, all the words, the technical fight principle, which I'm reintroducing. So now in this book, there's 10 technical fight principles and they're easily digestible for anyone that reads them. And all the original stuff is written into it. And I've, I've invited uh, Bob Wall, you know, who's been in, you know who Bob is, right? Uh, he's been in all the Bruce Lee movies, Chuck Norris' business partner since 78, uh, and, and a host of other characters from that uh, era. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Pennington, the founder of the American Open Style Karate System, actually sanctioned the, uh, him and Danny McCall actually sanctioned American extension fighting. So this whole group was like on needles of Ben going, what on earth has Jim West done with the tech, original technical fight principles? Yeah. And uh, I think it's pretty exciting. And uh, they're, they're, they're behind me 100% now. So they're going to back, back, back the book. So it's good stuff. Yeah. That's so awesome to hear. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, obviously it's been a very long journey for you and kind of a life's work to, <laughs> to put this together. Um, you know, you said this book doesn't cover, I guess, the, the moves, right? It's more of the Correct. mindset. And I wanted to talk to you a, a little bit about that. We've been telling people for years, and it's not, it's not our original idea, that they've got to get their mindset into the right place if they want to survive an altercation and how important that is versus just knowing how to do the moves but actually preparing yourself for that violent encounter where you have to hurt someone in order to save yourself. And Right. So... Interestingly enough, have you ever heard the term uncanny valley? I have, yes. So, you know, this Japanese guy in the robotics, was, it, 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 it's a way that robots would move when they try to humanize their movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, they move in these little quick jerky moves, which even though when you're looking at this, you, um, it's kind of eerie. 
you know, because mm -hmm. you know what's going on. They just turn left. But the way the movement t transpires, it creates an uneasiness and eeriness in, in, in anyone's mindset. And uh, so, so one of the overarching philosophies of everything that I've produced now is how to turn your defense into an offense and to do it quick, like literally in like one second, right? And uh, so I always have this idea that it's easier for me to teach if you and I can reach each other and put our hands on each other and start working from the inside out. So I, I use an uncanny valley effect up close. I can teach you in literally 10 to 15 minutes how to successfully execute uh, maybe five moves all up and down the center line, all hitting vulnerable areas, putting uh, anyone that comes in contact with you on the defense and defensive mindset. I was catching up right away. And there's some clues and guides, tips on how to generate that energy and power, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what you currently do. Uh, and so it, it, it's very cool. And I use this uncanny valley effect with the, uh, working from the inside out and I, I i call it you know the box and you know the box a, a lot of my other students dale included they talk about it but they haven't clearly defined th that it's virtually six cubicle feet directly in front of your body uh, nothing behind you nothing to the side and when you when you pick up a few techniques from this framing stuff you've seen me do the, in the past mm -hmm. and now we're adding the footwork and how to shift and shuffle inside um, this effect creates an eerie feeling with anyone that comes in contact with you. And if you put, apply your focus there, not say, you know, it's a spatial awareness that's very close to you because that's where the real threat is. Not to say, you know, don't worry about the guy crossing through the parking lot or watch for people's hands. All that's obviously stuff that you'll have to do and pick up on. You know, so I introduced, reintroduced, uh, the, the pins again. So, so, you know, everybody's given credit for whatever, uh, first person that wrote a book or came up with it, you know, so all that stuff is, uh, wrapped into this, but, uh, it, it, it teaches you how to focus from the inside out. So it kind of eliminates or greatly reduces the time for fear to set in or that anticipation. Oh my God, what's he got in his pocket? You don't even worry about it. It basically approaches the fight whenever all your other systems have failed Mm -hmm. except for this space directly in front of you. And uh, when your focus is there, the, the, the one thing you don't have in a real fight is time. There's no time. So I will teach you how to kind of blast out of that using every tool in your toolbox between one and three seconds. Wow. And that is explained in the book. So Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the, the mindset, you said in the beginning that – dealing with extreme violence is, is your forte. And, yeah, and unfortunately, and, uh, you know, most people, you know, they never come into contact with that. And so it's kind of a foreign concept. It's, it's something that they maybe have thought about. They don't really know how they would react in the situation. Hopefully they reach out and get some instruction from someone like you so that they at least have the knowledge. But what are some things that, that you see improve people's success rate? in those situations, things you've identified in people, maybe that, you know, if you, this type of person that handles this better, or you should cultivate these, you know, ideas in order to survive. Now, interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, Justin McCauley's fiance, Valerie, is a psychological research analyst for the University of Maryland. Okay. Never, she had one rape prevention class, which she thought was incredibly ineffective. She has no interest in going to the gym and learning how to train. But I've included her every time we meet in our meetings so she can analyze the psychological stuff of the system's approach and how we can break that down to, to analyze people's uh, areas where they need to improve and can improve mm -hmm. uh, in the Kaizen. So with that said, I'm a real hands-on guy. You know that. I like to just grab and touch and make things happen. I actually worked with her for less than 20 minutes and within 20 minutes she was hitting me full tilt and hitting uh well actually Justin in the diaphragm you know with full tilt complete energy zero thought process eliminating that 
it's what I call fight thinking. It's just, it's, it's when you can, when you can put your thought and your movement, this simultaneous with one another. So there's no time to think, right? You just do. Yeah. And I, I create drills and you and I might be able to, to do that on film actually, if you desire. Yeah. Uh, that will bring, you can take anybody off the street and the more docile, the better. Once we analyze what kind of fighter you are, aggressive, uh, counter fighter or runner, uh, we'll, we'll pick that up in the first five minutes and then we'll put you through some immediate action drills that, uh, you feel comfortable firing away. And that's anybody. It, it, it blew me away and it blew Justin away because he, he's been with her for seven years and she's a very meek individual. And uh, she was just blasted. And it's a really nice effect. So, uh, there are some training tips that will help people do that. Yeah. Yeah. Get people to that level. I know, you know, people are, I guess fighting is maybe more frowned upon now than it was maybe 30 years ago. Seemed maybe a little less acceptable for young kids to be scuffling and, and things like that. And, and getting people to a spot where they feel comfortable using violence. Um, you know, it's obvious that you want to protect yourself, but there's still, you know, you see people that kind of hesitate. They're just not quite sure. And I guess maybe that's where they're, they're thinking too much about it instead of just yeah. doing and not, just not really live. Yeah. Not living in the moment. And, uh, it sounds like what you're, what you're saying is that people need to learn how to stop thinking and start doing and, and really live in the moment instead of trying to anticipate what this person might do five seconds from now and worry about the immediate, you know, what they're doing right now. Listen, well, frankly, the person that mugs you or jumps you or attacks you in the streets, that's not what he's thinking about. Right. Yeah. So we want to turn that around. If you remember, uh, when last time I was there for the, we we're doing the towel on and all mm -hmm. that good stuff and, uh, the knives and we took the people from your camera crew and, uh, told them to stab that piece of beef and the first time out they didn't even come in contact remember that yeah i, w I was one of them i uh, yeah I, I didn't step in enough yep I, the, my distancing was was definitely off and within a matter of yeah a minute or two you're stabbing to where your thumb's going and penetrating the meat yep it's just a matter of getting the right right approach psychologically and at the time you're actually coming in contact when you know, because the pace and the rhythm that we pick up in the mindset, uh, you're not thinking about anything other than I just need to get a little closer. And the facts are once you hit it once and you come right back, it was easy. Yep. And it's just a matter of following up on those drills and putting them in, you know, a little bit of uh, saturation training, mm -hmm. which can literally be done in 10, 30 minutes, uh, a couple of days a week and you're on point yeah. whether you have a weapon or not. Yeah. Uh, the critical thing, I'm not telling somebody don't learn how to stand, don't learn how to throw a you know, balance punch or shift your weight. Obviously that's, that's critical, but uh, I'm a very hands-on guy and I like to do it through manipulation and practice right away. And it just seems to erase that thought process. And if you do it enough repetitions, it's like, look, anytime somebody touches me, I'm just going to, this is what's going to happen. And it becomes more instinct or intuition than it does a thinking process. Yeah. What would you recommend for somebody that maybe doesn't have a sparring partner? They may, you know, we, we sell um, courses that people can go through if they don't have a local dojo, if they don't have someone like you locally, you know, which is, you know, anybody that's able to train directly under you really probably doesn't know what they're getting you know it's a, they don't they don't realize the incredible value of having somebody at your level but there's you know there's a lot of people who simply don't have access to that they want to train with a video course um and the hands-on obviously is better than than not hands-on but what what could that person do to develop those instincts uh if they don't have somebody that can you know be there training with them you know it's really it's really awkward and it's difficult to describe but mm -hmm. uh but to, to to get somebody to that point you, you obviously have to have a target yeah uh, yeah you know the old karate guys the you know conditioning their hands on the makawari boards and all that mm -hmm. stuff um that's that's actually part of the game you know if they had a a target that they could 
create impact or stab, you know, like uh, some of those, some of those hit, hit, you know, dummies that we were st beating up, stabbing and cutting mm -hmm. last time. Uh, a heavy bag, a partner with a shield on their chest, a bulletproof vest, you know, whatever. And uh, create a, a force to impact the pun. Uh, I would start empty handed, just making sure that when I, you know, if I was using my palm heel and my fist, my wrist weren't rolling, I wasn't breaking my fingers, just, and just breathe out. And a lot has to do with concentration and focus and breathing. So, you know, you want to, you want to narrow that point of impact, uh, like a one by one inch, mm -hmm. not just a big, massive thing. And you want to control your breathing. So you're like an old key, I holler, like you stump your tongue, bah! just just blast you know and uh i would actually lower the lighting i wouldn't make it real bright just so you have to concentrate your focus i think environmental training is essential you know if you're in a some people don't perform well when they're in a big karate dojo and stuff they're more worried about pulling their punches and not hurting something else yeah. you kind of alluded to that earlier um and just you, you know one of the things i used to do when i was really young I used to get get up at midnight and just practice breathing and breathing out with all my techniques, pushing on stuff, you know, and then just hitting it, making sure that I was rotating my body and pivoting, you know, that high speed rotation is critical to uh, your strike and impact power. You know, th there's some word verbiage in the, in my new book about how to generate that power as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've got to lean in with your stuff without, without leaning. It's actually twisting into it, mm -hmm. but all your points of contact, you know, from the, I call it gravity fed, fed punching, you know, and plyometric punching. It's like taking a a medicine ball or a, a, a what do they call it, a, a anger, you know, whatever they do, rage ball, and just pushing it into a wall. It's like a football player, like a lineman coming off the line. All that impact has to take place at one time. Then it's just a matter of reaching into those toolbox kits and figuring out, well, what, what's available to me, what weapons. It's not just a, a punch or a palm heel. It's a head butt, a knee, a elbow, a shoulder. I mean, you know, Conor McGregor throws a shoulder punch and knocks out, um, you know, cowboy, you know, and, and all of a sudden the whole martial arts industry is going, holy crap, there's something new. Well, I, I'll tell you, I learned how to do that in a boxing gym 45 years ago, 47 years ago. So there's not, absolutely nothing new about it. Yeah. And it's it, it, it's a boxing foul, right? <laughs> so they don't teach the fouls. Well, that's not the purpose of Fight Fast or Jim West. We teach survival. And so the fouls are obviously labeled as a foul because they give you an advantage in a, in, in a sporting event. Nothing about what we do is a real sport. However, uh, their boxes, you know, you know the, the, the principles and stuff do apply to any venue, whether it's a UFC fighter, boxer or street fighter or some, somebody just getting mugged right yeah so yeah interesting yeah so um remember i'm not the student i'm the creator yeah <laughs> it gets more interesting hang around <laughs> yeah i mean there's just so much you've got such a vast knowledge base on these things i'm i'm uh this is probably one of those questions that that you probably don't like getting but what what's your go-to what's your go-to move in, in a in a in a situation uh, where somebody's attacking you or or an altercation's about to start. Well, it's really it's really weird because I can and I can answer both of those. What I what I can tell you what my not, non go to move is, is is to get in a strategic battle with anybody. You know, if you think about a minute, you you've ever sparred with people, right? Mm -hmm. When you're sparring, you're thinking about the rule set, whatever it is. You know, mm -hmm. angles of attack, you know, distance, all those that stuff jumbles your brain up, you know, and my go-to move is whatever it is, is to be first, you know, <laughs> Man, fight fast is a good, great, great title, right? Strike. Yeah. First. Um, so you have to be aware of social cues if you're out in public, for example, mm -hmm. and you, you know, and you got to trust your gut that there's no way out of this. And, and it's better than waiting on a guy because that's already initiated because then that's when the uncanny Valley and this shift and this, automatic explosion or that's just going to take their aggressive nature and make them think about what they're doing long enough for you to win. But, you know, my initial go-to move is when I, when I think 
there's no way out. Uh, I just fire. Bang. And it's just, a, it's that overhand right I talked about. I'll always tuck my chin and assume a position that's where my head's not going to get rocked. I don't care if I get cut or not, but uh, truth is it's going to be a uh, life altering overhand, right? I mean, I've knocked out a lot of people that you, you, you that are on your videos that you've known <laughs> and a whole bunch of others in rings and streets. And frankly, it's that my second go-to move is I'm only assuming that your personal space has been crushed and you're inside of that, uh, you know, those, those six cubic feet mm -hmm. and it's, it's a plyometric blast, but it's a, I love to headbutt somebody. So yeah. if it's not an overhand right, it, so so it's kind of overhand right, headbutt, and elbow. You know, actually a forearm blast the way I do it, uh, which which is pretty powerful. Actually, I've actually stopped a guy's heart in Richmond, Virginia, in the past with that punch, with that with an elbow. But my my sequence, whatever it should be, it should be fist, elbow, head. But fights happen so fast that probably if that if that first punch doesn't do it you're in a crash position it's what i call crashing a party so the head butts next you know and usually followed on by with the elbow just to make sure to put a stamp on your work yeah you know, everything from the waist huh talking to to different fighters that we've worked with that have a lot of street experience i'd say the headbutt i think all of them have mentioned headbutt in like the top three a lot of them the number one and i it, it's it sounds like it's probably not a surprise to you that that would be the case. And, and you found that to be incredibly effective as well. I mean, why do you think they took it out of the uh, UFC? Yeah. Because it, it, you know, you're not going to get three to five rounds out of a fight when a headbutt's in there. It, 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 it takes away from this sporting event. Plus it's ugly. Yeah. You know, I, I headbutted a guy and I was going to the combat diver course many, many years ago. Uh, you know, he was being a jackass. He, he walks in the bar with me and my two, force recon buddies were hanging around you know and uh i'm not force recon but my dive buddy was one and we've been drinking in esquire since noon one of the one of the other dive guys out of a fifth group guy comes in his first name was david but uh if he's watching he'll remember, have clear memories some things you just never forget uh he came in tried to hit on this chick that was just talking to us and i didn't care but we've been there for six hours and I just made the comments, Dave, you, you can hit on her all you want, but you have to take my bar stool. And uh, I've been renting this place for the last six hours, so you have to have to shift. And he shoves my beer out of the way and jumps up and rubs his pretty hair and his mustache. And he was a pretty guy. He said, and he, he flat out says, Jim, I, I know about your martial arts shit, your karate shit. I said, you do? And like, yeah, and I'm an asshole, you know. He goes, yeah. he says, you might even be able to whoop me, but if you do, he said, I guarantee you one thing. And I'm like, what's that? He goes, I'm going to take a piece of your ass with me. I go, oh, shit, really? I said, Dave, do me a favor. And I pointed my forehead. He goes, what? I said, take this piece. Pow. <laughs> I broke his cheekbone, his nose. I mean, stop. I mean, he, he had to get ambulanced out. Uh, obviously, he couldn't take the uh, hyperbaric pressure chambers and all that other stuff. He was medevaced out of the course and uh, never became a combat diver. You know, but uh, the one strike, literally, it broke his nose and, and uh, gave him a depressed fracture of the cheekbone that i don't even know if it was a great great headbutt or not but it worked out really well yeah uh, but he was standing right in my face he'd already violated you know distance everybody thinks is way out here on the end of your jab or your straight right hand you know everybody says your power's on the end of your punch or I, don't, I don't say punch i say the power's on the end of your strike and it can be this close you just got to know how to maximize that that energy and get it out of your legs and bring it up from, from the floor up you know yeah, and, uh, and, and if you spend enough time in a pushing and shoving, and that's part of the deal, you know, that's why I, another reason I mix all the, you know, created American extension fighting. It's it's a unifying skill set, but it also fills the gaps in other styles and systems uh, that maybe don't teach you how to stand really, you know, and do something so violent. That's a very violent act, but the truth is psychologically, it's just a self defense move. Uh, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, I guess practicing a headbutt maybe is something people don't like to do because it's it's fun to hit the mitts with your fists, but hitting your head against stuff, you know, you do it a few times and it starts to kind of, you know, make you feel a little uncomfortable. So, you know, is it something that people avoid training too much that they should be training more or how much do you really so have just, to think about it? 
I, I, I disagree to a point. I mean, if you ask a soccer player how much headbutt's involved in, you know, that, that, that game, it's, it's, it's a big part of the game. Yeah. So, you know, the secrets of making the tight, you know, the back of your neck tight, dropping your jaw and using the crown bone and keeping your eyes on the target. As long as you're doing those couple of items, uh, you can practice just making sure that everything impacts at the same time. Uh, when I first learned how to headbutt, I'd never done a headbutt. And we we're going to do an, a demonstration in Europe in a karate tournament. And, and uh, the guy goes, hey, Jim, I want you to, <laughs> want you to break this two-inch piece of concrete uh, block with your head. I said, okay. And we knew how to break because it's like what they call three points of contact. You know, you, it's all gravity related. You know, you, you, know you, you get in a stance. You've seen the guys, they, they get their fist all lined up, right, with the you know, board. And they breathe out and they bang and they break it, right? Mm -hmm. when they, you know, when they break slabs, they're, they're, they're sitting horizontally on the ground. So their feet actually slide out a couple inches and both feet reconnect with the gravity and the, or the ground at the exact same time you impact. Well, the guy was explaining us this, do the same thing with your head, get your all braced out when you're ready, just, you know, move your feet a little bit, bang, and impact. Everything lands at the same time. Call it three points of contact, right? Give me yeah. your elbow, your hand, your head, mm -hmm. and you breathe out. So I go, okay, I can do this. New. So <laughs> he puts a little little wash rag or towel on there. and I get up there, and I've never done this in my life. Never broke anything in my head. And I go, I just thought I could do it, right? So I go, oh, boom, and I looked up, and it didn't break, and there was a big spot of blood on me. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, shit. And then that rage uh, that, I, that lies just beneath my soul, you know, it's just part of who I am, grew up with. I just go, boom, and I just re-engaged instantaneously without thinking. Okay, this was 1974. And uh, I busted that little two-inch block like it was nothing. And I felt nothing. It's just a matter of commitment, right, which is a big part of anything you do. You just have to have that theory of commitment, which, you know, commit is, is one of my technical fight principles, right? I just mm -hmm. rolled up and explained. Uh, but you know, it, it, a lot of people say, what are you willing to do? It's kind of hard to teach people what they're willing to do unless they've done it. Yeah. So to practice a headbutt doesn't take much. You don't have to bust your skull open to do it. It's just get everything and momentum moves, shifts together, you know, and you can do it on a, literally on a towel or something, just light taps, just get that momentum and that, that nice flow and feeling down. I could teach anybody how to do it in 30 seconds, probably. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Would you recommend like somebody should be doing this on a heavy bag or so they can feel the impact? What should they be using to, to hit with? Yeah, a heavy bag works really well. You know, micro wire board, uh, any inanimate object, just realize that if, if, it's, if, if there's no space on the back side of it, you're never going to break it. But a heavy bag is going to move. It's very realistic to a point, you know, if it's a swinging heavy bag. So, you know, when it moves, uh, you got to regain your balance, right? If it's mm -hmm. so, so I think a heavy bag works well. So you got to shift and move, and it's part of the whole fight thing is continually movement, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, just getting used to getting three points of contact landing all together. Two of those points are your feet, and the other ones whatever you're striking with, and breathing out at the same time. So you, you just coordinate that breath control with three points of contact, and you can end a whole lot of fights really quick. Yeah, it seems like that's a huge piece of developing power. Watching you spar with some of the um, training assistants we had at the last uh, the, the last video shoot, watching the uh, ability that you had to develop power versus um, the competitive fighter that we had was very interesting. Um, I think it, obviously your technical skill is extremely high, but your footwork seemed to be so much more on point in, in your ability to, to deliver that power um, through your punches, even given, you know, that he was a much younger guy. He was maybe in his late twenties. You know, and he was think, current. <laughs> yeah. And, and yet you were able to develop a tremendous additional power than he was able to. And it seemed to me like a lot of it was coming from your footwork. Um, is that, is that uh yeah. Yes. I mean, every I call it in the in my in my book, A Mind for the Fight. I call it uh, gravity fed, you know, punching. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a little section on geometry of punching, 
and I have plyometric punching. They're three things or striking, right? Because, and uh, you, you know, definitely have to shorten your footsteps up because obviously if, you know, like I did, I trained with Bill Wallace for a while. And he, he does that uh, lead leg front kick from a high center gravity feet together. Uh, a lot of the Shotokan and old karate guys I used to train with, they have that really wide base, mm-hmm. which is good for defense from people running into you. But if anytime you have to move to move, it's really bad, you know, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And so your feet are, you know, about a little more than shoulders width apart. Your knees are slightly bent and the weights pressed down through the ball of your feet. That means you're standing on your tiptoes, but your weight, your weight, you should feel through the front of your knees. Right. And, uh, then the other part that's kind of left out is, is that rotation. It's, if you look it up, it's called conservation of angular momentum. Mm-hmm. You know, look at uh, guys like Tom Brady. He's not a really powerful guy. I mean, as compared to a lot of the other NFL superstars, right? He's probably fairly weak, but year after year, game after game, day after day, he can throw a 70, 80, 80 yard pass and hit a, hit a damn dime with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And how does that happen? That's the rotation part of it. Uh, so if you study any athlete that has a throw, to include a, a guy that throws a punch, your old style punches, if you look at those pictures of these old, you know, the artist rendition, their whole body's twist turn where, you know, they're protecting their shoulder, they're, they're punching hips in front. That is sort of an over-exaggeration. You may fall off balance, but, you know, sometimes you may, do, you may fall off balance. That's why I shorten the steps up so much. But and it's just bang, it's just a, and and this, I, I I actually want to do a segment with you on the uncanny valley. That's that it all works right inside of that six cubic feet, which nobody's explaining in the context the way I do, mm-hmm. and it's a big part of the overall program and it's how we teach from the inside out. You know, so I can you can take the average person that's never had a fight and in a very short amount of time, have him exploding. In, in a real fight distance, right? Which is here. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I think that was one of the things that surprised me most about that was, I guess it seems easier to develop power when there's a little more space, right? You can take bigger steps, you can move your body more, but you were developing such tremendous power in really confined spaces. And I think that's what maybe a lot of people are missing when they're training because so much real fighting happens nose to nose and and in that short distance to be able to develop power in that short distance i think there's a lot of technical skill involved in that and that like, that's one of the things that you offer is your experience in that range and the the technical skills to actually do that i i, I mean you know there's so many people professional not just the ones that you know others i mean world-class top tier fighters i've trained with and I think most of them could probably whoop my ass, but the first time I make contact with them, their whole mindset changes. They're they're not wanting to get hit twice if they're even conscious at that point. And I knock people out with body shots as well. Uh, So, you know, it's not restricted. And then if it's a street fight, it can go much lower. And, you know, like I say, all the vulnerable areas, you know, I I jokingly call myself the ear, eyes, nose, and throat doctor, you know. But uh, all that stuff works. And I think you really – very eloquently describe where my power base really sits all the time is where the real fight happens. And, you know, I mean, you've got guys on your videos that, you know, in your company that are, I mean, excellent. I would pay to learn from them, you know, because what they do is that good. It's just, I, I work in this space that most people are uncomfortable with. Yeah. And uh, I just, I don't know, maybe when I was younger, I got jumped a few times because like I said, I was, I had a reputation very young. When I weighed 110 pounds, I was knocking people out. So two or three guys at a time, one would distract me, the other one would hit me in the head. You know, even as a when I was in the, you know, recently retired in Special Forces, I've had seven beer bottles broke on my face, stabbed in the back, put my nose, the end of my nose cut off. You've, you've seen the scars. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've recovered from all that stuff from, you know, something as simple as learning how to keep my – chin tucked when I'm in a crowd, my, my shoulders rolled forward just a little back of my neck, a little stiff, not overly stiff, just enough that this chin is right where my head's not going to shake around a lot. And uh, I don't run my mouth a lot, so it's hard to catch me just talking a lot of shit. And uh, truth is, I've just, I feel lucky, but that luck is based on, you know, practical experience, you know, and every time I've ever been in a fight in a ring or out or in a gym, 
I learn every time somebody touches me, I take it personal, you know, and uh, I don't ever want to be hurt twice the same way, you know? So yeah, I've learned how to, I've learned how to captivate and own that, that space, what I call the box. And uh, I think that's what people need to really learn, you know, even, and that's the neat thing about extension fighting, you know, uh, is that no matter what you do, I like to fill those spaces, you know, and those gaps within your own, organization because listen whether you're in the street or a ring the second the first punch lands or the first strike it becomes total chaos you're either going to panic and get beat up or panic and win uh, or 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 just energize that initial moment you know and that's where i live so you know i don't walk around the streets worrying about oh my god what happens and and unfortunately i learned you know i want people to learn from my experience i learned because i have been ambushed a few times, you know, and, uh, come, you know, a lot of stitches and scars, and, uh, some bad nerve endings left over, you know, but, uh, I survived each and every one of them. And not only did I survive, I thrived, I won, you know, and, uh, it's just something that's built into me from a very early part of my life. But like I said, I'd rather people learn from me you know, my experience and not have to experience it self. Yeah. And if they're ever caught that way, they just, you know, hopefully through a couple of, you know, drills, they'll learn how to, you know, know when that, when, when, when those bars line up, it's time to go, you know, mm -hmm. whether you run or fire to me, it doesn't matter. Fight or flight. Now, basically by training with me and by the concepts, it, it virtually eradicates the flight or fight, you know, and just, it allows you to fight effectively and never over 10 seconds, you know, literally between one and one and three seconds. Uh, you know, that's, uh, you're going to run into a couple of hard heads and not everything's going to work, but you know, follow through is very critical. You know, you don't quit till you're done. Yeah. And that's easy to do when no matter who you are, once somebody tries to hurt you, because you know, once that happens, you're in the survival mode anyway. And just why not take that energy and utilize it, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the real me, down and dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I I have a rage inside of me because I have been hurt, you know, and I don't like it. Yeah, I I think that's important for people to get in touch with that so that they can draw on that when they need to, uh, you know, because yeah. those situations that they'll come, you know, and you need to be able to tap into that energy and and take care of business. You know, and to address something that you you mentioned earlier, I'm not sure <clears throat> exactly where it comes from, but uh, I think a large amount of people they talk street fight and they talk this and they talk that, but the truth is they they seem to be hand handcuffed by social norms and political correctness. And obviously, you know me well enough for a long time <laughs> that I, when it comes to critical you know mass. Last thing on my mind is political correctness. You know, it's, yeah. it's just, you know, it's with me, it's a hundred percent life or death. And, and I think people should think about it that way, because even if it's a, a barroom brawl where two guys, you know, you, you hear the old stories, Oh, we got in a fight in our old days and then we go drink beer together. Well, let's, let's, let's dive a little deeper and say somebody, you know, you have that mindset, somebody hits you and you're not fully committed, obviously. And if you trip and fall, hit your head on a corner of a bar or chairs, you, it could, it could be life ending, even if it's not intended. So for me, you know, it's those unintended consequences that drive me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Every, every altercation could be life and death. No, no doubt. There's no, no padded floors on the street. I mean, look, there's 300 fatalities every year from guys falling off the ladders. The majority of those falls happen under 10 feet. Yeah, you know they hit. It's just slip, falling, and stumbling into crap. Which, when you're amid the chaos and extreme violence, how easy or how hard is it? I mean, you know me. I'll step on your foot in the middle of a fight. Just, just if I shove you, you're gonna fall down. Yeah, you know that. And boxers have been doing that for years. Yeah, nothing, new, nothing new in this world of violence. It's just how you capture it and present it. You know, and I've, I've been so engaged for so many years. And I, I'm fortunately I've, I've had a lot of technical training along the way, 
So I've, you know, I figured out how to combine that and make it make sense, you know, to people. Yeah. Well, we're definitely gonna get gonna get the book, tear through it, and uh, we'll have to do another another podcast where we can d- dive into some of these principles because I definitely uh, definitely want to get that out on the airwaves for people to listen to, get some interest. Um, so that they yeah, can- please do. Um, yeah. We'll talk about that offline too. But uh, your 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 level of intellect and experience with working with God knows how many hundreds, if not thousands, of badasses through the years. You know, your whole existence has been, you know, learning, you know, what people have to bring, you know, to the front, you know, to help other people. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm dying to hear your feedback. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, and just so you know, other people's feedbacks, I, I'm looking for them. Is, you know who Bob Wall is? Bob Wall, you know, those, those Dave Grossman, those, those guys, you know, Jerry Pennington, those are the guys, I mean, that brought this – to the forefront of in, in American history to begin with. Mm-hmm. And now it's been rearranged first time in, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 years. And it's been around for 2000 years. So, you know, I'm dying to hear the feedback. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to grab it as soon as we end this call and, and <laughs> start tearing through it. And we'll, we'll definitely get you back, back on the podcast and, and kind of dig into those in detail and maybe yeah. people have questions they can, you know, everybody go out and, and get the book, tear through it. And if you've got questions, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it and, and get Jim's thoughts on it. Yeah, I'm all about it. You know, I like to be challenged, not in the street sense. I've been there enough, but uh, intellectually with my experience of what works, you know, yeah. method of, I've lived by a very simple philosophy, what works, works. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, and what works for me is not going to work for you. And what works for you may not work for me. And, and that's why it's good to, bring in all of our history, you know, from the streets and from the martial arts community and from sporting events, you know, cause I've got all that stuff bundled up inside of me and I've, I've been blessed to have had one to be here today and two to have the experience of working with the, the greats of the world, you know? Yeah. So yeah, just trying to, to evolve it to the next level. My, my core belief is that we're constantly evolving and, and, you know, just like Bruce Lee did back in the mid seventies when he, you know, early, late sixties or early seventies, when, you know, he brought, you know, Wing Chun to the forefront, uh, there are gaps in that, but, but him, Joe Lewis was an innovator, you know, all these guys and all these greats and, uh, you know, 40 years later, 45 years later, I think, uh, if we don't move now, we're going to miss the evolutionary train. So it's just time, you know? Yeah. So here we are. All right. Very good. Well, it was good talking to you. And uh, we'll, we'll get you back on the show to, to d- really dig into the book. And like I said, if people listening out there, go grab the book. So, you know, if you tear through it, if you've got questions, um, you know, anything you want Jim to explain in more detail, you know, we can, we can do that. Yeah, we can do it here on the podcast. Uh, they can do it because uh, I know you tagged into my uh, uh, James Smokey West or whatever facebook so you know we can go back and forth there too anything that comes from you and yours you know i'll I'll happily uh personally answer you know in person or on the you know type it in whatever you know yeah uh, yeah i'm not shy all right (laughs) well as always it was a pleasure talking to you and uh hope to hope to hear from you soon and uh thanks for coming on the show yeah thanks for having me dan it's always it's always great with you thanks